Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Tejin Park. Um, I'm happy to give a talk today, and I really appreciate um, everyone um, give some time to come here uh, to take my seminar. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a little bit about what I've done during my PhD. Um, my presentation title is the Toward the Better Understanding of Changing in Northern Hemisphere Vegetation Using Long-Term Remote Sensing Data. So with a brief introduction, I'm going to move on to what I did um, my PhD period. So as we know, the uh, climate change is uh, evident. And then um, from the, the historical record, we do see that the um, global surface temperature has increased 0.2 degrees Celsius for every decade during the last uh, three decades. And then the, this warming pattern is a more prominent in the high latitude region known as the Arctic amplification. This um, warming climate change um, um, also changed the physical environment of the high latitude region, um, such as um, the, the sea ice melting or permafrostal or the extensive the drought event we can see um, from the uh, last multiple decades of observation. This environment changes with the warming also um, directly or indirectly impact on the vegetation structure, function, and also composition um, in, a, in a different pathway. For example, um, there are a lot of the, um, the drought or the insect induced tree mortality and also the warming induced tropication or tree advancements happening um, in the high north environment. Also, the human industries changes like harvesting and also the agricultural activity also uh, change the landscape in the um, northern hemisphere uh, vegetation landscape. So, in this circumstance, it is very critical to understand how the vegetation has been changing during, um, the, during the historical period. This is because the, the northern vegetated area holds more than 30% of the global carbon, and also it is a critical component of the Earth's climate system. For example, vegetation can change the albedo of the surface, and that won't uh, impact on the energy balance of the Earth's surface. And also that one um, it can alter the nutrient cycle or the water or water or carbon cycle um, in the Earth system. This is a very important to understand because that can feed back to the Earth system and can make a positive or the negative feedback system in the Earth system. So uh, how are we gonna um, monitor this uh, vegetation changes um, where the vegetation located in the remote and the biased area? The answer is a satellite remote sensing. The satellite remote sensing is the only practical way to monitor this large and remote area. Um, as you can see from this plot, the green line it shows the, how the uh, vegetation is um, vegetation reflectance observed from satellite can be varied by different wavelengths. As you can see from here, um, the red that red wavelengths we do the vegetation really observe for their photosynthesis activity. But the, the near part they have the scattering event happening. So this contrast um, spectrum signature is usually used for the sensing vegetation quantity um, in the remote sensing community. So there are two widely used the vegetation um, the measure. The first one is the normalized different vegetation index, which is a simply calculated from the this um, location. And the other one is the leaf area index, which gives you some idea how much of the leaf area exists in the unit surface area. This is usually um, the estimate from the inversion of the latitude transfer, um, relative transfer model. And um, um, to get this kind of the remote, the remote sensing based measure of the vegetation um, um, quantity, um, there are two widely used satellite sensor. The first one is the advanced very high resolution radio mirror um, called FHRR, and it spans from the um, early 1981 to the all the way to uh, current. And then also the other one is uh, the moderate resolution imaging spectrometer called the MODIS. It started from the 2000 February to all the way to current um, period. And in this uh, focus, in this presentation, I'm going to use uh, these two indices. 
and also um, this two sensor to show how the, um, the long-term historical vegetation changing over time. So here I, I'm going to uh, present the two focused areas. The first one is the green season and seasonal total greenness over the northern vegetation. And the other one is uh, the disturbance of human activity in the greening and browning pattern. Here the greening means the increasing trend of the vegetation greenness or productivity. And then browning means the decreasing trend of the vegetation greenness or um, productivity. So. Um, uh, with the, I'm going to um, give you more detail in the following slide. So for first, first um, the focus, I'm going um, to I'm going to um, invest. I'm going to present the, what I found from the uh, growing season and the season total greenness changes. The motivation of the, this study is based on the, this simple two um, figures. Um, this is a three decade of annual, annual and seasonal profile of the NDVI from the different <coughs> location. Um, as you can see from here, this is a y-axis NDVI and then the axis is the day of year. And you can see that the black line is a, the 33 years mean NDVI. And then the darker gray and then lighter gray give you the one standard deviation and two standard deviation of the NDVI profile. And but this this um, this uh, graph is the same thing but from the different location. But we can see that the how um, different location of the vegetation seasonally respond differently. For example, these side cases, a lot of the variation happening in the uh, early growing season and the maximum period. And then the other one is the shows the end of the green season really very much. But the most of the study have been done, they usually uh, focus on the individual component of the seasonal metric. For example, the, the onset of the green season or end of the green season or they just are looking at the as a whole, like an annual mean and DVI, how they are changing. But we do not know how uh, this kind of seasonal variation characterize the annual uh, total greenness of the vegetation. Um, for this focused um, presentation, I use the um, AVHR NDVI, um, and then there is a version of the GIMS NDVI 3G. And that um, spans from the 82 to 2014, and eight kilometer, and they give the um, bi-monthly data set. Um, to um, to um, specify the seasonal uh, vegetation profile, I extract the growing season start and end. To do that, I additionally introduce the modis snow cover data and the microwave based the, the ground fridge cell condition to define the growing season more accurately. And then I'm gonna bring the NASA mirror reanalysis data, um, which give you the daily temperature. And I'm gonna bring this one to see that how the NDVI based the growing season and the summer growing season, they are um, uh, response um, similarly or differently. Uh, we can see how the climate and vegetation couple together or not. And then the lastly, I also use the FluxNet GPP uh, data um, to, to evaluate the, uh, whether our extracted growing season matrix is uh, reliable or not. So this is a validation purpose I brought into looking at the data. So this is an overview of how I'm gonna uh, extract the uh, vegetation growing season. Um, to do, before I, extract the growing season uh, matrix from the uh, NDVI uh, seasonal profile, I first did uh, some pre-processing. Because uh, the GIMS NDVI 3G cases, they, they, they didn't have the well-qualified um, the snow cover and the cloud cover information. So I did the, I, I brought in the, um, um, the modest snow cover data to constrain the um, GIMS and DBI seasonal profile. And then I also use the statistic equality filter to smooth and then exclude the unrealistic NDVI uh, data um, over the time series of the NDVI data set. And um, after pre-processing, I use a 25% of the amplitude and also satisfying the sowing ground condition to define the growing season. 
this is a crit um, the making the, this sowing ground condition is a critical for the evergreen forest cases because evergreen forest cases they um, usually higher NDVI even in the spring or winter time. So um, this sowing um, ground condition gives some idea um, when the vegetation productivity are really happening during the seasonal uh, cycle. So from this uh, definition, I extracted um, the onset of growing season SOS and the end of the growing season EOS and <coughs> calculate the uh, length of the growing season. Um, and also, I calculate the growing season summed NDVI called the GSS NDVI, which is uh, the annual total greenness level of the vegetation. Uh, for thermal growing season, I set the zero Celsius um, as a threshold um, to define the growing season start and then end. Uh, once the um, seasonal temperature is crossing the zero Celsius, I set the growing season start and end like this way. And I also calculate the growing season sound one feedback to compare with how the warm and the, the greenness change over time. Uh, before I move into the more uh, deeper investigation, um, I did some um, the validation work uh, using the um, added covariance data. So over the 49th added covariance site, I get the, about 121 um, the, um, the GPP site years. And then I compare the conventional approach without the winter NDVI um, um, pre-processing and also ground freezing soil condition. And this is a conventional approach. This is a, what I applied uh, for uh, this study. And usually the, without the, the pre-processing and uh, um, uh, defining the um, uh, sowing ground condition, we did have a lot of the, um, the, the earlier growing season start and then the later end of the growing season, which result in the much longer um, the vegetation growing season, actually. But once we apply um, the pre-processing for the winter NDVI and also the Region soil condition, we do have like a more than 70% of the um, GPP based growing season can be captured from the um, this NDVI data set. So, this is a, how the hemispheric scale, um, the growing season matrix, to change over time during the last um, three decades. So, this left upper panel shows the growing season start. Um, the green color is an NDVI-based growing season, and red one is a temperature-based growing season. As you can see from here, um, the onset of the growing season really tightly coupled with the um, growing season temperature. Uh, I mean, um, the, the temperature-based um, onset of growing season, and it reached about 0.8 uh, correlation coefficient during the last three decades. And they are. Um, getting earlier and earlier patterns, we do see that. And but the end of the green season, they show the the later um, end of the green season during the last three decades. But there is uh, some disagreement happening uh, when we're looking at the interannual variation. This kind of um, pattern, um, pattern, and the length of the green season from this um, two matrix, we do have. Um, the lengthened pattern during the last three decades. And um, um, annual total green is showing the um, increase in pattern during the uh, last decade with um, the warming pattern. Um, here, I also bring in the um, other independent GPP product from the Max Planck Institute. And this one also give you, the purple color give you the how um, the NDVI-based growing season sum, the NDVI, really well capture the vegetation productivity activity. So this is some summary of how they really changed during the last three decades. So as you can see from here, the left left column is a NDVI-based growing season. The, the other one is a temperature-based growing season. Um, the, let us first see the upper panel. This is a um, circular scale. Um, as you can see from here, growing season start during the last <coughs> decade advanced about um, 5.3 days earlier, and then end of the growing season is uh, delayed about 2.2 days. 
But compared to the NDVI growing season, NDVI based growing season, temperature growing season has a much different. The end of um, growing season start part is pretty similar to the NDVI based one, but the end of a growing season is much uh, delayed. Um, this is uh, some um, is likely due to the different um, control of the end of the growing season of the vegetation. Um, in, with uh, some other literature review, people already found that the end of the growth is in case that um, the radiation or other nutrient limitation can also make a variation of the end of the growing season. So that is likely due to um, this kind of other, the underlying driver make a decouple with the summer and the vegetation growing season change. So this is a, some pattern of the how the vegetation and growing season change over time. This is a, the growing season start, the trend map over the, our study region. And you can see that a lot of um, um, the European, European forest area, they show the advancement happening. And also widespread Eurasian forest also give some earlier pattern of the growing season. Uh, also, maximum NDVI, we see the duration vegetation shows a really higher increase in, in the vegetation indices. And also, the, uh, the North American Arctic vegetation also shows a really rapid uh, vegetation changes. And end of the growing season shows a different pattern with the growing season start. And this all together making the large scale greening pattern, what we are seeing from the annual greenness level. Um, the NDVS 3G data shows about 33%, 42% uh, of the area showing greening, and only 2.5% show the browning pattern. Um, so, um, but uh, compared with uh, this um, vegetation changes, we do see that some part is matched with the annual greenness level, but they are really jointly control this pattern. So um, I did some this uh, semi-partial regression analysis to quantify the which factor is really driving the annual greenness changes. And this is a map of how they are differently contributed by different factors. So here, the, the red column means that SOS is a dominant um, factor. And the uh, blue one is a maximum NDVI, it's a country really. And then EOS is a end of the growing season, is a more dominant factor um, characterizing the interannual variation, uh, variation of the NDVI, annual NDVI. Um, um, with uh, this analysis, we see that the most of the area shows uh, about 90% the variance explained <coughs> using this only three variable. So, so our following question is, uh, what kind of factor really um, characterizing these differences of the contribution? Um, um, I first uh, um, I first propose the, the climate constraint may have um, um, the, um, the law um, making these uh, differences. So I just uh, put the temperature and the water availability index called the ratio of uh, actual evapotranspiration to potential evapotranspiration. And we do see that a lot of um, the clear uh, pattern of the um, this contribution. For example, um, colder and then drier region where the uh, Arctic environment is located, they have a, a maximum NDVI driven. This is because uh, the Arctic vegetation cases, they have a relatively small, the shorter uh, growing season. That's why summer vegetation activity is a really um, matter of the annual total greenness. And once we move to the really warmer and then the water availability it increase, that is about where the boreal forest existed. And then they mostly driven by the, um, um, the growing season start part. But the once the warmer part, more warmer area with a um, more warmer area, we do see that the end of growing season is really driving the pattern of the vegetation changes. But once we extended the, our area to the whole um, circumpolar scale uh, with the temperate region, we do see those other different patterns. The more stories are coming in. 
So for example, we do see that the, a lot of the end of the growing season happening, uh, contribute more over this area, but we also see the maximum NDVI is really driving this part. Where is uh, more the grassland or the shrub, shrub uh, vegetation is uh, uh, located in? And this gives you some idea climate constraint and also um, the plant functional type really driving the con different contribution of the vegetation seasonal changes. Um, this is a for focus one summary. So from this um, work, we, we do see that the satellite like corridor extend the extended trend of the lengthening growing season and enhance the annual total greenness during the last three decades. And also we see that the regionally varying seasonal response are linked to the local climate constraint and also growing season and plant functional type we could see from this result. And I'm gonna move on the second uh, focus. Um, so for second focus, I'm gonna talking about the disturbance and human activity, how they are, um, what, what is their role in the vegetation change in the northern uh, land. Uh, this is a, a widely, the most of the study using the large scale study, they mostly ignored because uh, um, course of legislation data cannot capture the land survey history like a land uh, disturbance and uh, human activity. So with the, um, so uh, in this study, I brought in the, um, the Landsat scale, um, the land survey history data, and also use a large scale, the 500 meters MODIS data to looking at how vegetation interact with the different land survey history. So for this study, I'm gonna, I use the MODIS area data as a main um, data set. And uh, to improve the quality of the observation, um, I um, combined the Terra and Aqua Modis uh, area product to the one, um, one um, the better quality observation. And it spanned from the 2000 to 2017, and it is a 500 meter um, resolution. Uh, in this study, to minimize the seasonal, um, the growing season impact, I just uh, fixed the growing season to June to August as uh, the mean area. Um, for the disturbance history data, I aggregated five different history um, disturbance information. Um, the fire database cases, I get, I got some data from the Canadian Forest Service and Alaska large fire database and also the landscape based fire like uh, from the 1985. In a harvesting data set, I used the USFS harvesting record and also landscape based harvesting record from the 1985, um, which, is, which was generated by the um, Canadian Forest Service. So based on the, this kind of the data set, um, I first investigate how the biome, how this vegetation changes different by biome and also the weather disturbance happened or not. And also, I also looking at the how the disturbance over the vegeta disturbed vegetation, what is the load of the timing and type of disturbance making different uh, special pattern of the vegetation uh, changes. And I also looking at the undisturbed vegetation using the land of forest approach um, to figure out which environmental factor um, regulate different changes. So this is a map of the, um, the disturbance select board. Um, as you can see from here, the white color shows a low disturbance. And in this study, I set the disturbance um, um, as a fire and harvesting only because of these two um, disturbance is more visible from satellite sensor and also they have the longer, longest time record. Because the other insect related disturbance, they only record from the, the, the later 2010 and that's why it's hard to know the other um, the variable. So in this study, I only focus on the fire and harvest. So from this image, we can see that the fire is a really um, the dominated pattern of the disturbance in this region, and the, they are mostly um, the situated over the boreal region, as, as you can see from here. The most of the boreal region they have the largest proportion of the fire disturbance. 
And once we move to the harvested cases, temperate region is a dominant region, and the boreal is also contributed a lot um, for the harvesting. And this is a, um, the how the vegetation changes over the last two decades, and is a much higher resolution and much better quality than the uh, NDVS region. And as you can see from here, um, the widespread uh, greening pattern we can see from the Arctic region, but a lot of the patches, like a more patchy the greening and browning pattern we can see from the boil. And also we see a lot of strong the signal of the vegetation changes happening over um, this kind of area. So let us see what is really happening over um, this region. The MODIS gives the 500 meter resolution. We can see the, what is really surface is changing, how they are changing. So uh, I select four different sites from uh, each vine. And then this is uh, the first site from the interior Alaska here. And this is a fire disturbance from a region. And this uh, first panel shows uh, the high resolution uh, satellite image, as you can see. And this one is a disturbance history map. So different color give you the different uh, timing of the disturbance. So uh, purple color is an older, um, the area having the older disturbance event. And then the um, brown color give you the more recent disturbance happening. And this is an area trend, what we saw at the last slide. And let us see first the site A. Site A, uh, from this image, we can in intuitively know um, this um, landscape is really heterogeneous. As you can see from here, um, the, a lot of the patches are making like this way and this way, but this patches is really well matching with the, where the disturbance is happening. Um, when we compare with the MODIS data, MODIS data also shows that this kind of pattern. where the non-disturbed vegetation, they have a relatively stable state, but once the vegetation uh, disturbed, they have really rapid vegetation changes happen. This site B is the uh, edge of the um, boreal and temperate uh, echo zone um, near, um, the, uh, near um, the Canadian, um, Canadian and US border. And this site is uh, the harvesting practice is a, a prominent area. As you can see from here, um, the purple color um, is a dotted one, is a showing the, all the harvested practice. They are really um, small patches. But as you can see from here and there, um, the area trend, um, the area really captured, modis data really captured these small patches changes from, as you can see from here. This kind of small patches, MODIS really well captured this change. So let us move on the Arctic cases. This is an Arctic site. Um, this is a over the Hudson Bay uh, region. And this is a really remote region. And also, uh, the people are really interesting to looking at this site. This is because the other sensor, like the Landsat data, also shows significant um, greenness changing over this region. So when we're looking at this area, this like area looks like almost a tundra region. There is not much greenness over there. And also, there's not much fire and the harvesting activity, of course. But we do see a lot of the greenness changes happening over the Arctic region, especially over the really um, uh, the river basin area. We see a lot of the greenness changes happening over there. And let us move on the site D. Site D is here. This is a Canadian freighter, and then there's a lot of agriculture activity happening. Um, we, we do see the, a lot of the, um, the patches of the agriculture practice happening here. And then compared to the Arctic region, we do see more than four times higher rate of the changes happening in the um, agriculture region. This is a, um, the we. This is a, so how the, the human land use management really changing the land, landscape uh, significantly. So um, summarizing this kind of um, the result, um, this is a, some area perspective, um, the result. Over the 33% of the North American region, they show the greening. 
Um, but that one is only 8% region over the whole of the Canadian Alaska region is associated with the uh, uh, disturbance, showing green. And then the undisturbed region, 25% region shows the green. But once we, um, from this area perspective view, the disturbed area doesn't really contribute much. But once we calculate the, how much of the leaf area changes um, from the disturbed area or undisturbed area, disturbed area contribute more than 42% of the net leaf area gain. Um, that means even we have only 8% of the region showing this change, the net leaf area gain is really from the disturbed area, not the undisturbed area. Of course, we also see cropland and the Arctic vegetation, they really contribute much, but the temperate and boreal region, they are relatively smaller contribution compared to the um, <coughs> So um, this result is uh, the cumulated, cumulated is uh, just total leaf area changes. And when we divide, normalize by the area, we can see the how much the area, leaf area changes per unit area. So this is uh, the normalized by the land area. So the upper panel is a disturbed and the un, uh, lower panel is undisturbed. And then we can see the, the mean rate of change of the area. Uh, disturbed area shows a re relatively strong rate of the changes, as I uh, told you last slide. Uh, but interesting point is a uh, cropland here, as you can see here, um, compared to the undisturbed other, um, the biome, it is a uh, three times or four times a higher rate of the changes we could see from the result. So, why, why this kind of disturbed area is showing this sort of rapid increase of the changes? This is because the, um, the net nature of the uh, vegetation grows uh, with basically back to the time. So um, this purple color is a fire disturbed the area and give you the area trend, a function of the year of the disturbance. So as you can see from here, the recent disturbed area shows a negative trend. And then once the five, uh, once the event is, uh, goes away, and they slowly recovering, and then they pick about the 15 years and the 20 years, and then they slow down the rate of the changes, and then finally they uh, reach to the neutral state. And an interesting point here is that the, they, the harvesting case have a uh, overall similar pattern, but they have a little different. But what is the difference is their rate of the change is uh, much rapider, and then they reach it, uh, I mean, their resp recovery response is much faster than the harvesting. And another point I want to notice is that the net leaf area changes Net, net leaf area changes. Actually, net leaf area changes is a function of the rate of the changes and the total area of uh, the vegetation changes. But interesting point here is that a lot of the disturbed area before the 1970s, they really doesn't contribute the net leaf area changes. The most of the net leaf area changes are from the recent disturbed area, like the 20 years ago, um, if there is a disturbance, they really contribute in the landed rare changes there. And um, because of the, the area changes, does, um, uh, greenness changes, because of from the uh, ground study, a lot of people um, already found that um, ground scale, we do see the after disturbance, we do see the um, vegetation composition changes. I also investigated how the uh, vegetation composition changing over time. But because of the um, um, absence of the um, accurate land cover information, I used a set space for time substitution approach to looking at how the land cover changing over time different over the different uh, recovery state. So this upper panel shows harvesting and the lower panel is a fire. 
Um, and then the axis in the ear since the harvesting, the negative means the before the um, uh, disturbing event. And then the positive means the after how many years you left, I mean, past the after disturbing. As you can see from here, harvesting case, most of the, um, this disturbance happening over the mixed forest and also um, the coniferous forest. And then after <coughs> disturbance, even they disturb, the forest still existing. And then after five, five years, they fully recover to the, um, the initial state of the uh, <coughs> forest condition. But their composition is a little dif different. They have more mixes for it. Um, that means they have more, um, the deciduous forest uh, fraction is increasing over here. But the fire cases have a li little bit different. Fire cases, the mostly happening over the conifer forest, but 80% of the disturbed area is from the conifer. This is the, um, true that the um, North American um, the conifer forest is relatively um, the vulnerable to the uh, fire, and then they are mostly burned. Um, uh, they are mostly impacted from the fire disturbance. After fire disturbance, actually they lose most of the fire. This is uh, some contrast between the North America and the Eurasia um, vegetation. The North America fire case, they are mostly standard replacing fire, so they burn everything. So in the Eurasian cases, they are like a superficial fire. They only uh, uh, burn the crown, but the, the North America case, they burn everything here. So after fire, we see that the most of the forest fraction is uh, gone away, and then they slowly recover to um, the uh, uh, forest fraction um, uh, slowly. And, it, and at this initial stage, the most of the area um, is dominated by the shrub and the grass the community, and then they just uh, slow fade away um, with the encroachment of the um, forest the stand. And then the interesting point here is that the conic forest forest, um, actually it takes a really long time to recover. Um, from our result, even it passed the 35 years or 40 years, still only 40% of the uh, um, Forty percent of the initial state of the uh, vegetation, uh, forest uh, composition. Um, so, so far I talked a lot m about the, how the disturbance impact on the vegetation and also how the human activity impact on the um, uh, vegetation changes. And this uh, this slide, I'm going to give you some idea how the undisturbed vegetation changes. So I use the land and forest uh, based the analysis to uh, figure out which factor is really driving special pattern of the area trend. Uh, I use the, uh, the area trend is a function of the climate and the baseline area, which is uh, the first year of the area. And then also I put the topographical index, which um, characterize the, the microclimate of the vegetation. So I did this analysis uh, separate by different biome. For Arctic cases, um, the most important factor is a baseline area. Um, this is a, a, a makes sense. This is a because uh, the Arctic vegetation community is really harsh to establish the vegetation first. So there is if there is a known vegetation, it's hard hard to increase the greenness um, during the last two decades. That's why the initial vegetation state is really important for. Um, understanding special pattern of the Arctic vegetation changes. And the other three is the most important thing is the topological index. So um, these three indices um, actually um, really driving um, the Arctic vegetation changes. And this uh, topological index also really matter in the boreal and temperate region. Um, as you can see from the, um, the TPI aspect, or slow really matter for the uh, oil and temperate region. Um, I think uh, um, this is not actually I expected from my <coughs> initial state because I expect the, um, the warming um, really driving the vegetation changes. But from my analysis, um, I realized that the 
the worming is really large scale um, pattern. So uh, even we looking at the 500 meter by 500 meter, we're looking at different changes of the um, vegetation. But the warming is like, you know, the large scale circulation of the climate. And they pushing all the vegetation uh, to some point, but they don't really capture the special detail of heterogeneous of the vegetation change. Um, here's a summary of my focus too. So from this um, focus two study, I real um, I show that multiple driver, including natural and anthropo anthropogenic disturbance and agriculture activity and changing climate, really um, govern the large scale green trend in the northern land. And the timing of the type of disturbance is really important to fully um, understand the vegetation changes, and also existing vegetation state and topographical features are important to understand the changes in the undisturbed vegetation. So, um, concluding remark, um, northern vegetation has rapidly changed and is in its greenness and growing season and composition and seasonality. And satellite remote sensing can detect these changes by providing their underlying drivers. And we require an, a multitude of approach that consider linked climate and social and ecological drivers and process to fully understand complex and heterogeneous vegetation changes. So this is what I all prepared. Thank you so much. <laughs>